welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dr. Dan Sutter of the Johnson Center for Political Economy at Troy University. Nothing compares with a good old-fashioned hockey fight for aggression and chaos. A closer examination, however, reveals that hockey fights are governed by their own code of conduct. And as economists looked further, we found similar rules in place in other sports like baseball, football, and cycling. What can we learn from this hidden and unexpected order in sports? And what lessons does this provide for the organization of the world around us? Joining me on eConversations today to talk about some of the, his research and the research by other economists on the informal rules of sports is my colleague from the Johnson Center, Dr. Dan Smith. Dan, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Dan. Very happy to be with you. Well, let's get started here. When we think about hockey and the, the aggression, you know, the primordial aggression and, and seeming chaos of, of hockey fights, we have a couple of pictures here. Uh, most of our, our viewers would probably be shocked to think that there's any kind of, of rules governing this at, at all. Yeah, it certainly looks like anarchy on the ice out there, but when you actually dig into the details, you actually see a, a, a code of conducts being followed by hockey players, certain norms for initiating fights and for completing fights, and there's actually a, a, a lot of order that emerges and actually in, plays an important role in actually reducing violence overall in the sport. Really? Well, that sounds pretty fascinating. Let's just try and get into this here. And so when you're talking about the rules here, you're not talking about the rules that we have in hockey to cover because there is like a, a or you can get a penalty for fighting, right? So mm -hmm. it's not the, the, the official rules that we're talking about. Yeah, whenever you look at sports, usually there's an official set of rules, the, mm -hmm. you know, the official guide uh, rule book that the referees or officials actually enforce. But there's usually also, especially when there's a lot of things going on and the officials can't see everything, there's usually a set of informal rules, official, unofficial rules, mm -hmm. that govern things uh, among the players wherever the official rules don't reach. So what are some of these uh, unofficial rules then in hockey? Yeah, so obviously hockey is a very violent sport. It can be very dangerous. Players are going at excessive uh, speed. They're slamming into the boards. They have essentially razors on the bottom of, of their feet. Mm -hmm. uh, they have wooden sticks they can use to jab other players with. So there, there's a lot of room for a lot of violence to 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 be and, and for players to actually get really seriously injured or even mm -hmm. killed uh, so outside of the official rules the hockey players have uh, developed these informal rules that help govern play in order to make the hockey players safe safer and part mm -hmm. of this process is hockey fighting that they use to enforce the, the rules of fighting so some of these rules that emerge are Hockey teams actually have specific hockey players that specialize in fighting. Mm -hmm. they're, they're called enforcers. And typically, most hockey fights are going to be between those enforcers, where you have the one guy on your team is going to get in a fight with the other guy, and they're designated fighters. Um, the reason for this is you don't want the skilled players getting in fights and getting hurt. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, if a skilled player engages in, in dirty play or otherwise uh, violates one of the informal rules of hockey, they may end up having to defend themselves in a fight and, and facing the repercussions of that. So, so it seems like there's a whole list of these sort of informal rules that you're not supposed to be violating when, when you're having a fight, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and these are all, the players obviously want to engage in a fight. Sometimes it's because there was a perceived violation of informal norms. Sometimes uh, it's to get the teams going. Maybe the, the score is, is lopsided and, and the, the losing team wants to you know, get a spark in their team and their, their fans. Uh, but they also want to be safe. They don't want to seriously hurt each other, though they do want to engage in a fight. So they have to first initiate a challenge, and it has to be accepted. It is mm -hmm. uh, against the informal norms of hockey just to throw down your gloves and start punching somebody if they have not accepted the challenge to fight. And another uh, rule that also involves safety is once the other player is down on the ice, you quit fighting, the fight is over. Mm -hmm. And that's just to ensure that the players aren't seriously injured. And in some ways, this isn't you know, a complete shock because you know, we've always had the ideas of, oh, you have, you're supposed to fight fair. So even mm -hmm. though you are fighting in, in many contexts in life, I mean, there, there are so, so, uh, some rules here, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, sometimes the players will be mic'd, and you'll hear after the fight, they'll say, good fight, like, uh, or you'll even hear them initiate, like, hey, it's time to go. 
Um, so it, there's actually a, a, a order. So it looks like chaos. There's actually mm -hmm. order to, to how these fightings go. The, the fighting goes, and you have to fight fair. Otherwise, you receive a, a bad reputation uh, from your teammates and from around the hockey league. Now you mentioned the possibility that the rules like this actually could make the game safer in some ways, and not just in the conduct of these fights, but in, in, uh, beyond the, the fighting. It makes other elements of the game. It helps police other elements of the game, right? Yeah. So with such a dangerous sport and so much that the refs and officials can't see. Now, obviously, it's gotten a lot better with modern camera technology, and the league mm -hmm. can impose penalties after the game, um, such as fines and things like that. But because it's such an danger, inherently dangerous sport, uh, one of the ways to reduce the overall level of violence is to have this threat that if you break informal uh, rule, if you put me at, at danger, uh, put me in a dangerous situation, breaking one of those informal norms, then I'm going to retaliate with having my uh, enforcer, the guy on my team that starts the fights, go and, and, and initiate a fight mm -hmm. with you or the or, or your, t uh, your the enforcer from your team. And Gordie Howe, and there, there's lots of players that uh, um, acknowledge this, but he said, if you get rid of fighting, you are going to get a lot more of the dirty play. Let them fight, get rid of all the stick work, uh, you let them get rid of the aggression, solve it out on the ice with just a, f a simple fist fight that's relatively safe, and then it dissipates the, the aggression and allows the, the hockey game to continue. And this is a guy that certainly knew a lot about it. In fact, uh, the Gordy Howe hat trick was actually a normal hat trick in hockey, scoring three goals in one game. Uh, but a Gordy Howe uh, hat trick would be getting one goal, one assist, and then getting in one fight. And I remember, you know, they've they had banned. Uh, fighting in international hockey, but uh, many people were making the observation that there's still a lot of this dirty stick work. So I used to say that international hockey in some sense was clean, wasn't completely true. There was a lot more of the, the stick work and you just couldn't go back and retaliate mm -hmm. in the same way. Yeah, and you also see it, the, the violence coming out in the gameplay. So if I can't start a fight with you within the official rules uh, and that's prevented, then I might like try to jab my stick into, you, into your uh, gut or do some other dirty mm -hmm. uh, play that's actually going to be more dangerous than the fight. Now, we mentioned that you know, the National Hockey League has rules about fighting. You can get a five-minute uh, penalty for fighting, and they have some other penalties that would be related to it. And uh, we've been talking about these informal rules. Now, I mean, if you think about it, they can't have be listed like, say, these informal rules can't really be in the rule book, the mm -hmm. official NHL rule book. And if they're in uh, unofficial rules, then they're probably not relying on the officials themselves to uh, enforce penalties for this, like a, that, like they do for the the fighting penalties and other penalties against uh, illegal use of the stick or, or tripping or so forth. So, where do these rules are come from, and how do they end up getting enforced? Yeah, so these rules just develop spontaneously among the players through different interactions. They learn lessons as they go, saying, okay, well, that, that, we've had enough of people getting hurt this way. We're going to start a, a new informal norm for, for this. And it's enforced among the players themselves. They actually have to perceive the violation and then go out and enforce it. And the way they enforce it is uh, through, through fighting. So that's how they actually, uh, whenever uh, another player trips up another player and the, the, the official doesn't catch it, well, the fighter on that team can go actually punish the other team and say, hey, that was crossing the line. I don't want you to do that. And it gives the, their, their skilled players more space on the ice to score goals. And might end up, therefore, you know, making the game more interesting for fans as well, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Overall, these, these rules definitely make the game safer for uh, the hockey players themselves, but also add another element of excitement and uh, intrigue to the game as well. Now, hockey's not the only sport where we see rules like this occur, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, almost every sport. Uh, and the more dangerous the sport, the, you, the more you see these informal norms. But almost uh, every sport you can think of, football, baseball, uh, even uh, in the Tour de France, uh, you're, you're going to see these informal norms emerge among the players uh, in order to supplement the official rule book. So even though it looks like there's chaos here with a, a baseball, baseball brawl, there's actually some reasoning or some order behind it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Just like in hockey, there's there's certain reasons why these types of fights emerge, perceived violations of an informal norm, and it's a uh, once again it's it's developed spontaneously among uh the, the league's history. The players mm -hmm. have developed these rules. Sometimes they change, uh but there are a set of informal ro uh rules in baseball that all players must abide by. 
Now, we've mentioned hockey and baseball and uh, football is a violent sport where <clears throat> the players could be at risk of injury. Uh, is it only sort of in these violent sports that we're going to see these kinds of rules or could there be rules that govern other elements of, of competition between the players? Yeah, so you primarily see it in these violent sports. So in, in baseball, for instance, uh, you can you can hit a, a, a batter, you can beat them with the ball and, ser and do a serious injury to them. You can also slide into uh, a baseman and with steel cleats, you could actually seriously injure that person mm -hmm. or you could injure the catcher, take them out. So informal norms uh, largely emerge in those, uh, whenever there's violence, especially violence that can't be uh, readily perceived by the, the referees or officials. Uh, however, you do see these informal norms also govern things besides violence. And baseball is actually kind of interesting in that um, you see uh, sportsmanship norms emerge, mm -hmm. such as you don't walk in front of the catcher um, when you're going up to the, to the batter's box. Uh, if you hit a home run, you don't sit there and just stare at it and kind of gloat. Uh, there, so there are some game, gamemanship norms that you see being enforced in the baseball code as well. But there's also other sports where you see that. Mm -hmm. And you've done some research on some of these uh, things, some of these uh, rules in other cases, in particular the Tour de France, right? Yeah, so the Tour de France is a really interesting case. And, and what actually alerted me to this is I, I was watching it one year, and I noticed on the last day of the event, they're riding into Paris, and the leaders of the race don't actually compete against each other. That race you see in the Champs Elysees is the sprinters competing against each other, but the leaders of the race, the people that were maybe like 30 seconds apart from each other, competing for millions of dollars of prize money and advertising endorsements and, and the glory of winning the Tour de France. They're drinking champagne, they're toasting each other, they're eating ice cream cones, uh, going at a leisurely uh, rate. And I was like, whoa, what's going on? Like, uh, how did this emerge and, and are there other weird rules like this uh, in the Tour de France? And so that sparked your investigation, right? And you ended up writing a, a, a research paper to, to detail some of these rules. Yeah, it's, actually, it's very uh, fascinating, uh, some of these rules. So whenever they, uh, something I never thought about and most people that don't watch the Tour uh, avidly don't realize is these uh, riders are riding for several hours. Mm -hmm. each day for 21 days and you have to go to the restroom well th there's the rules governing the informal uh, norms governing when you can go to the bathroom and that all the other riders actually slow down if uh, a rider in contention for winning the tour uh, needs to use the restroom uh, you also see slowing down uh, if, if a leading rider falls mm -hmm. you actually slow down and wait for that rider to get back up uh, to catch up um, another rule you saw was uh, during feed zones. So there's zones you go through and grab like power bars and things like that. The riders all informally agree to slow down, let themselves eat, and no one attacks when everyone else is eating. And, and what's an attack? Uh, an attack, attack would be when you actually try to go out ahead of the rest oh, okay. of the riders. So most of the riders in the Tour de France ride in what's called the peloton. Mm -hmm. And that's the main group you see when, on TV. But riders sometimes will attack and try to go ahead of that peloton, mm -hmm. and you don't do that during a, during a feed zone. Now, this is an interesting case because uh, you, you mentioned in your paper that uh, there are, there's the organizers of the Tour de France, and they're coming up with the formal rules, and, and you see this in other sports as well. They have the formal rules where they need to try to make the event entertaining and interesting enough that it can compete with other sports out there, other forms of entertainment for our, our uh, consumer's attention in dollars because uh, I mean it is a, a one level of business and so they're they're putting some rules in place for that but then we also have these informal rules and so sometimes these rules can complement each other right yeah absolutely in fact I argue that the unofficial norms actually supplement uh, the official rule book and increase the profitability of the Tour de France and the reason for this is some things like the the constitution of a rider's uh, bladder shouldn't uh, dictate who wins a race. If, mm -hmm. if you're a big fan of the tour and every year it was who could sit on the, the saddle the longest without going to the, the restroom, well, that's not really who's the best uh, cyclist winning the race. Uh, so, th Or if you happen to fall, accidents happen. You don't want that uh, determining who's going to win the, the overall uh, Tour de France. Uh, so the, amongst themselves, the riders say, uh, informally agree, hey, Fans don't want to see that determining who wins the tour. So what we should do is we should all agree not to attack during those times. Mm -hmm. So that increases the attractiveness of the sport to the fans. Now, you also mentioned the, the fact that um, 
doping has been a big issue with the Tour de France, and you know the, there was an informal norm that arose amongst the, the riders to, to about keeping secret about doping activities mm -hmm. of, of other riders. So these informal rules don't always necessarily line up completely with uh, say the more formal rules or the desire to have a, a marketable sport, right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, doping uh, was one of the, so when I started this project, most people were telling me, well, the Tour de France riders, are, are, they have this ethic of sportsmanship in Europe that just isn't uh, prevalent in America. They're, they're just these gentlemen out there competing, and that's why they have these informal norms. But if that were true, it should extend to doping. Mm -hmm. right? If it's game and ship, then it should extend to doping. But in fact, uh, all the evidence we have is that doping is rampant in uh, the Tour de France. Um, so the official rule, the, the, the official rule makers for the Tour de France they would prefer not to have doping in the sport. Mm -hmm. Fans don't like the fact that some riders are doping, others aren't, and that's uh, giving some riders an advantage, and therefore it's, it's not pure competition. Uh, so they have the incentive to make it illegal. But informally, the riders, it's very hard even amongst themselves to know who's doping and who's not. So the informal norm is actually not to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And anyone that accuses another rider of doping is actually uh, penalized by the peloton. So the informal norms actually work against the official norms, mm -hmm. and uh, so, so it's not always uh, complementing and always working in the same direction. You also, going outside of the context of the athletes participating in the sport, you also, have, in some of your research, looked at the, the what are known as uh, soccer or, or football hooligans, mm -hmm. and some of the activities that go on outside of the, I guess, off the playing field amongst the fans. Mm -hmm. uh, what are soccer hooligans for some of our, our, our viewers who might not be familiar with that and, and then you know we can get into what the economics of hooligans are yeah so in addition so you saw the the norms emerge in hockey mm -hmm. but hooligans are, are people that actually get together and fight each other because they enjoy fighting with each other mm -hmm. and they're associated with a a, a, a soccer club and I examined uh, soccer clubs in England. Mm -hmm. So each soccer club has an unofficial firm, is, is what it's called. And these are a group of, of usually 18 to 35-year-old to men uh, that like to engage in a, in a bout every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, but the problem is, is that when you start this type of, uh, I'll, I'll use the term uh, fight club from, from the Brad Pitt movie, mm -hmm. uh, which is very similar to actually what's going on, is these, competing firms actually call each other up and say, hey, our teams are playing, let's get in a fight, we'll meet here at this time. Um, and they actually have rules that they create in order to ensure that a good fight occurs, but that it's a fair fight and that people don't get seriously injured. And so in this case, it's amongst the fans, not the sport, the participants in the sport itself. But again, there, there are rules regulating the, the violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, uh, soccer hooligan, hooligans actually create kind of a, another sport, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, even though officially it's fans of a sport, it's a, it's a sport in, in and of itself. So you have these fierce rivalries, rivalries between these uh, firms. And each year they get together when their teams play and they'll engage in fights. Uh, but like I said, uh, sometimes the violence can get out of hand and people mm -hmm. get seriously injured. Uh, so they wanted to create a set of rules such as don't bring a knife to a fight, don't bring a gun to a fight. Um, you, uh, you have to wear certain colors that identify you as being a part of the other firm. Uh, bef before you can attack them, you have to identify that they actually are a member and they have to accept the fight before engaging in it. Now, we've talked about a lot of these different types of informal rules. Now, some of the interactions between the formal rules and informal rules or actions that the uh, organizers of a, a league or event might undertake, uh, can the informal rules sometimes be, get uh, disrupted or, mm -hmm. or interfered with uh, the, their sort of normal enforcement process uh, by interventions by different authorities? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, you've, you've seen this in hockey where uh, the introduction of safety equipment that is supposed to make the sport safer actually prov uh, makes the sport more dangerous. Mm -hmm. And in part because it, it hurts uh, the ability of hockey players to enforce the rules via fighting. A good example of this was the introduction of the helmet. Well, it certainly has created more safety when it, in terms of pucks and getting hit against the boards. It also made it harder to engage in fights. Mm -hmm. So a, a lot of uh, economists actually argue uh, that the introduction of some safety equipment can actually make the sport more dangerous. So it kind of disrupts these informal processes uh, for developing that order. 
Well, this is all, all tremendously fascinating, but uh, some of viewers might be looking at this like, oh, these examples uh, from sports uh, are, are amusing or entertaining. They're part of our, our entertainment world. Does any of this stuff have any applications to the rest of our economy, our real world or, or economic history? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, this is uh, the most exciting part about this type of research is that you're taking a, a, a portion of the population that is extremely aggressive, usually has higher testosterone than the normal population, more narcissism. They're competing for glory and a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And yet, the, even if they're fighting each other, they can come to create these informal norms that are mutually beneficial and enforce them amongst themselves without any need for an official referee. So this offers a lot of lessons for uh, normal economic activity, most of which occurs outside of the official rule books. Uh, the ordinary American does not depend upon the state or official police officers in most cases throughout their, their normal interactions. They go to the store, they buy something online. Most of the time, these are not governed by formal rules, but by informal uh, norms. So you, you, things like uh, you're supposed to wait in line mm -hmm. if you're at the, the, the checkout counter, right? You're, you're, you're supposed to actually obey the line. You're not supposed to just cut in, in, in a line, and that's enforced sort of informally, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and you, in, you, in fact, when you saw more line waiting in countries like the Soviet Union where they got rid of the price system, so mm -hmm. obviously they had a lot of line waiting, you actually saw entire cultures emerge around how to stand in line, especially for lines that lasted more than one day. And this was not uh, out of the ordinary <laughs> in the Soviet Union. You actually had ways to mark your spot and mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, these informal norms that made sure that you didn't dis dis uh, disrupt into anarchy and chaos. So, how far you know, do we observe, in what kinds of different contexts do we observe some of this uh, order emerge? Did we see it, for instance, in places where there are, there's no government to begin with? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, some, those are some of the most fascinating cases, is when you see informal uh, norms and rules emerge without any official governance whatsoever. Uh, and, and one of the most interesting cases is the California go, uh, gold rush whenever you had these mining camps emerging. You saw it in medieval Iceland, you saw it in some African uh, villages. Um, you saw it in, there's a book by two economists, P.J. Hill and Terry Anderson called The Not So Wild Wild West. Mm -hmm. uh, before the state uh, actually had official law enforcement out in the, the West, it was actually a lot more peaceful than you, you see it depicted in Hollywood movies. They actually had these informal norms and a way to govern themselves in order to create peace and allow economic transactions to occur. So, so for instance, then, like, you know, when we had like the gold rush in California or Alaska, and you know, thousands of people from all across the world are going off there to seek their fortune. They were almost entirely male and, you know, mm -hmm. they just had high levels of <laughs> testosterone. And they're out in the frontier. There's no established government or, or established uh, uh, legal authorities out there. Uh, there was actually uh, uh, you know, some kind of order or, or informal rules in some of these mining camps. Yeah, absolutely. Whenever you, they got there and they arrived, uh, they immediately recognized, hey, we need some type of, uh, of order around here because otherwise it's just going to be chaos. Obviously, there's no official government, so they have to informally, spontaneously agree to a set of rules and how to enforce those, those, those rules. And this worked? at least uh, somewhat well? Yeah, you, you, you saw it working uh, fairly well there in the Wild West. Uh, lots of examples around the world that you see these informal norms either operate without official governance or with very little uh, uh, need of the formal governance uh, structures. So another element, so this seems pretty amazing, but uh, another element that you talk about is uh, when we're talking about the rules is that you know, the rules of hockey or the rules of baseball are sort of created by no one individual, but they're sort of there and you have to learn what they are. I mean, do we see other examples of rules that sort of like emerge out of no, you know, seemingly out of nowhere? They're like the, the rules of baseball, you know, the informal rules of baseball are, that aren't written down anywhere, but everybody seems to know. Do we see some other examples of this in our economic or business lives? Yeah, in fact, uh, most people are, when posed with that question, they say, oh, I can't, I can't really think of anything that would develop spontaneously and formally among people and actually play an important role in society. Uh, but when I tell them two examples, usually they're taken back and like, oh, wow, I never really thought about it that way. And one is our common law. 
Mm -hmm. Common law is almost completely created uh, through these informal uh, rules that developed over time in England, where judges would uh, hear cases and they'd make a rule on that case, and that would become a, a precedent that would be followed uh, later on. So it, it created a, a set of rules that you could structure your business arrangements by. So you said, okay, this judge ruled this way. So we know going forward that that's going to that's be the law, is in that type of context and mm -hmm. situation, this is what's going to happen. Uh, so the common law and the law that we largely follow in the United States today largely develop spontaneously. You also see that with uh, language. Language itself, no one sat down and created the English language or any other language in the world except for one uh, created language, which is called Esperanto, um, that failed abysmally. Um, but all of languages besides that one just developed informally amongst people. They developed different ways of, of saying things, indicating what they're referring to, and the rules of grammar and speaking, and such like that. Uh, so it wasn't created by anyone, yet it's, uh, it's a, plays a very important role in society, obviously. So some of the, the, the rules governing our, our legal transactions and property and, and, and contract and so forth were created just by like these judges or something making rulings, not out of like a legislation or anything? Yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't a top-down system. It was more of a bottom-up discovery process. Mm -hmm. uh, when people in a business are engaging in transactions, oftentimes you don't know ahead of time what the optimal rule will be. It, it's very hard to forecast for going forward every type of situation that's going to emerge. And you just have to allow uh, the discovery process. Oh, well, here's a new situation, and we hadn't expected this to emerge. Mm -hmm. But now this is an interesting case where what's more important, property rights or, or the, the, the intent of the contract. Uh, so they have to interpret and make rules uh, so that they can carry forward go, going forward. Whenever someone is in that situ uh, similar situation, we know what the, the, the rules will be. And there was, I understand that there was a lot of trial and error in this process. I mean, when a, a judge had come up with a ruling in some cases and they came up with a ruling that didn't end up working, it didn't end up actually holding, you know, applying for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's one of the primary benefits of, of, of the common law in this bottom-up discovery process is whenever a bad rule is made, there's still time to overrule that. that there, there's still a process for changing those rules and it's not going to be the official rule for all time, especially if it's a bad rule. Do we see any uh, other type mechanisms like this uh, operate in business today? Oh. Yeah, so the, probably the best example is uh, international transactions, where almost all of international trade is governed by private association, and ar or, sorry, private uh, arbitration. So mm -hmm. the vast majority of all international transactions occur with no government overseeing them. There is no world government, right? These, we have come from different nations that have separate laws. But when you actually think about it, someone from the United States trading with someone from China, where do you take your, your dispute? Mm -hmm. Do you take it to the United States or do you take it to China? Well, it's going to be biased if you go to one or the other. So people engaging in international trade have tended almost overwhelmingly to prefer private uh, arbitration, where they agree ahead of time, we're going to go to this reputable firm that uh, is known for making wise, unbiased decisions, and that's where we'll take our disputes and we'll uh, abide by whatever decision uh, they, they render. And arbitration also plays a role in a lot of business or, or consumer disputes in, in, uh, in the U.S., right? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, our, our court systems are so clogged up that a lot of businesses in America, even though they're not engaging in international trade, actually uh, specify ahead of time that they want to go to private arbitration mm -hmm. rather than go to the formal court system because it, they can predict it better, it's easier to get in, it's more cost efficient, and it's a lot more reliable. Well, this is all quite fascinating. So it seems like uh, once we looked in sports and saw some of these uh, hidden you know, forms of order that, that they are actually quite pervasive. So what's sort of like, you know, if you want to summarize in a takeaway point here, what's, what's the big, what do we really learn? Hidden order, or I just sum it up as hidden order is all around us and it governs most of our transactions. Well, thanks very much for coming on. This has been fascinating. I hope you've enjoyed it. Thanks for joining us. Join us again next time for another eConversations.